Love Podcast Hate Nonsense. This is the Politics Joke Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! <laughs> Scream if you want to go faster. <laughs> Ava Santina, how the living fuck are you? Oh, I'm so great. Got in late last night from the... Uh, oh, yeah, we've had a bit of a nightmare with that, haven't we? What? What is it? Oh, right. It was better, better than it was about three minutes ago. Well, I'll tell you what. Look, it is ice cold. It's, it's frothy. <laughs> she's, to that. she's a creamy one. <laughs> Look where I'm talking into the mic. Mm. <laughs> Should I move it over? Is it, all, is it all wet? No, it's not at all. But I mean, I was sitting here in the ah, mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to um, I'm going to do some beer ASMR whilst you compose yourself. <laughs> anyway, how are you? How was Barcelona? <sighs> Stitches. Uh, lovely, lovely, great place. Um, beautiful wedding, my dear friends. Um, parts it was a, it was a Mexican Canadian well Mexican American Canadian wedding so it was bilingual which um, as a as a Catholic yourself you will know that uh, mass and particularly a uh, wedding can t- it can drag you know to be to be well there's a lot to get through particularly when it's in two languages yeah and you know bless the bless the bless the priest actually been flown in from from Texas um, family priest um and uh, and yeah, he delivered. He did the service uh, in in a church that wasn't his. I think it's quite quite a trying trying exercise. Um, he blessed a couple of my mates in my presence, and actually one of the um, one of the Mexican abuelos, uh, whilst the blessing was taking place, I was like watching it, and he came over and, and tapped me and was like la cabeza, mm. and made me bow my head in, yeah? rever- in reverence. Yeah, yeah. Were, were you revered? Uh, I was. I revered the blessing. I didn't receive a blessing myself. Right. I'm I'm a godless fuck like that. Um so I um I made I made a I made a point of also <laughs> say the rosary three times. Um it, I made a point uh of of not saying any of the, the you know the call and response stuff. Mm. Which actually another interesting thing. Did you know in Spanish um you know how we say god obviously. They they have they have dios. Mm. But um you know how we say the lord. Mm. They just say señor. Oh, really? Yeah, which I found incredibly funny because it's like Mr. Mr. Not Papi. <laughs> no. Ay, <laughs> Papi. Yeah, maybe. Um, big Papi in the sky. So, yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. I think I, got, I, think I got a little, caught a little bit of colour in me. I don't know. Well, well I thought the colour might have been from the small holding, but no, that's just pure. No, not out labouring. Although I've got to tell you, my garden has been uh, deeply fruitful um, in recent times. I've had two courgettes this October. What did you make with them? Uh, last night, I'll tell you what I did. I, I sliced the courgette uh, lengthways straight down the middle and then I sort of did a cross hatch across both sides of it you know the inside that you've cut in half and then the back mm. and then I quite heavily salted that uh, oil in the pan smashed garlic into the oil to sort of get like a nice garlic oil and then just put each half of the courgette in that and just get it like a real nice crisp um, and it was, it was porous then with all the yes, lattice no, cuts. exactly the lattice yeah. exactly the heat gets into it so you get a nice um, you get a nice little little crisp on it, so that was delicious. And I served that with um, cannellini beans, sadly not from not from the garden, and my last remaining cherry tomatoes. Uh, it was delightful. It's a very good bounty. I mean, so I was hearing about Sean's bounty on the way up to Liverpool. Yeah. Um, t- two yeah. measly tomatoes, one of which apparently was bright green. He was politely told by his missus, that is raw, not ripe, mm. raw. That is <laughs> that is not ripe. Mm-hmm. To which he said, "No, it's just a green tomato." Ate well, it and then had to pretend he wasn't disgusted <laughs> as he choked on it. <laughs> yeah. So with the um, with the green tomatoes, you can do one of two things. Really, you can either turn them into something. So, for example, you know, like a green tomato relish. You get some. You get some. Uh, you get some chili in there. You 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 cook that down. You jar it, and then you've got that for for the year. Or if you have enough of them, and because Sean only had two. You probably wouldn't get this effect, but the way that tomatoes ripen is that they release this gas, which I think is called ethylene. And basically, the more if you put an unripe tomato in the environment of other tomatoes that are at varying stages of ripeness, even though they're off the vine, they will they will continue to ripen. It's the way supermarkets transport tomatoes to you from like um, Spain, for example, is they pick them green 
And then you know how they'll often have those plastic bags around them. Yeah. They pump that plastic bag full of the gas. Why it's got holes in it then? Because um, it does. Some of them have holes in, don't they? To get the gas in. Yeah. And then um, because the presence of the gas means that tomatoes ripen in transit so that when they arrive in the UK, they're ripe and can be sold. Wow. Yeah. So, for example, because someone asked me this, we're already on a massive tangent, aren't we? Um, someone asked me this because I picked, I basically took my entire tomato harvest in and about half of it was green. And they were like, why have you picked the green ones? And <laughs> You don't know about the ethylene, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I was experimenting to see if they would ripen. Oh, right. And they did. Hmm. They did. Um, so I was very happy with that. Not similar, but on that, on a tangent. No, I'm going to leave that. Yeah? I'll tell you after. Okay, look forward to it. Shall we get down to political business? Yes, why not? Um, God bless you. God bless you, Laura and Sean, for being at Labour Party conference for the last three days, which is, in my personal view, a fate I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But nonetheless... I had a great I, time. Yeah, you all three of you said you had a great time, which, you know, I learned a lot about each of you, yeah. <laughs> when, you when you gave me that answer. Tired today, though. There was a point last night where we were on the M6. Toll, of course. Took the toll, you know? Oh, fucking champagne socialist. Well, politics, Joe, you know... I wanted to contribute to infrastructure. That's what absolutely I to do. as we all. I should. also wanted to shave ten minutes off the. Uh, <laughs> what five hours? Yeah, yeah, it was a long time, long time. Mm. Anyway, there was a point where we were on the bridge. We had to walk over the motorway bridge to go down to Burger King, mm. and as we were walking, I thought, "Geez, this is fucking miserable." <laughs> <laughs> but that was only at the end. Yeah, at the end. Um, only because it was over. Only be- oh, I see, I see. I see. No, and no, not, no, no. Not, not because you had to spend another three hours in the car with, with Laura and Sean. Well, Sean kept playing Things Will Only Get Better. <laughs> <laughs> well, over and over again. Yeah, nice. constantly. Very good. Very, 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 very good. Um, I think they played, I, th- I, I believe um, a certain newly elected MP dropped Things Will Only Get Better as his opening opening track of his set. He, he might might well have done. And I think we should actually put the video in here. Oh, you've got a video of it? We've got, no, we've got a video of Sean reacting to it. Perfect. Great. I wouldn't sing along to that because someone in the subreddit said that me singing gives them the ick. Not because it would contribute to you being the ultimate Madri man. <laughs> you cut me to my core. I know, that one, I know that one really hurt you. So I'm sorry <laughs> for bringing that up. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, best party of conference? I had a really good time at the CWU. Okay. That was great. Why? But also, like, I want to... I don't know how it happened, but I was in the DJ booth for like a good hour. You're a fucking celebrity now. Right? No, That's what happens. Stop People want that. you in the booth. Stop that. People want you in the booth. Stop that. Because <laughs> I, particularly as well, and this, I'm not trying to be. This is going to sound like I'm being mean to you, but I'm oh, not. Good. But I'm not being mean to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's slim pickings at Labour conference. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, who's in who's in the back of Getter's booth? You know, at a Schwire. Yeah, you're probably you're probably not getting the call up. No disrespect, but you're probably uh, not. You're probably, you, not, you're sorry, probably not getting the call up. Maybe not anymore. Back in the day. No, I didn't mean it like that. Was I in the no, booth? Stop. Was I in the booth at Ashwire? I absolutely was. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, most of the people at Labour Conference are like faceless suits. Right. You're not gonna. You're not gonna pick out. I don't know. Fucking. West Streeting spad and be like, get up in the booth, my man. Well, you might have done. At, you might have good gun at, fingers. at a different party. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. But maybe at the dinner. That you, we're talk on about. the other hand, you're bona fide now. Do you know what I mean? You are bona fide. You're big time, big time. They want you in the booth. This is making me so uncomfortable. I know. That's I why. Know, that's why yeah. I'm hammering it. Yeah. yeah. This is because I called you the Madry man. Isn't yeah, it? it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, CW was best. How was the Jamaica party? I can't describe to you that Jamaica party. Were you in the booth for that as well? I was in the booth yeah, for that go, as well. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Dawn Butler hosts a Jamaica party. Yep. It was huge, huge. I mean, she filled like a, a concert hall. It was unreal. How many are we talking? What's the door? How many do you reckon there, Laura, Sean? Good couple of thousand. A couple of thousand? Yeah, it was big. Um, Sadiq was on the decks. 
Can he DJ? Well, I, I DJ press play. There was DJ there was music cable. playing, and he was standing there. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I've identified the opportunity to drive a rift between you and the rest of the team. Okay. Were they in the booth as well? Uh, I. They. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we yeah, go. Yeah, for Dawn Butler, we were, all went up there, didn't we? We all went up there for Dawn Butler. Champagne for my real friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, real pain for my sham friends. Sean, Sean got a bit of fruity with the drink selection at one point. Should we, at this point, it's like, you don't wanna... should there be a third microphone? Yeah, I do want to hear the story. Oh, it's right, like, oh I he's, see. He's, he's, he's mixing the thing, isn't he? Oh, so. yeah. This is so fourth wall for the audience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, lads. So when I was like, so he kept kept bringing me drinks kindly, yep. but you know, with the vouchers I gave him, so it wasn't, you know, it was it was lovely that he did the manual oh, labour. Oh, so he was bringing you the drinks. He was, right, yeah, yeah. yeah anyway, and he kept bringing me rum and pineapple, <laughs> which is, like oh, hadn't asked for. All right, I see. I see. It was just quite entertaining to think of him at the bar going, you know what she'd like? A spiced rum and pineapple. Yeah, I don't. That's not your drink, is it? No. What is your drink at an event like that? Should we should we let them decide in the subreddit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So head to the subreddit. Let us know what you think Ava's drinks order is. We should do the politics. We've been rabbiting on yeah, yeah, for a little yeah, yeah, bit yeah. too long. I'm sure, you know, obviously the drinking scene is pretty strong at these things. But um... Well, can I caveat by saying starting with, an, with starting with one event, which I actually thought was quite important. Yeah. So Peter, Peter Mandelson was there. Oh, of course he was. I know you're a big fan of his he's, work. Yeah, he's back in now, isn't he? He's in the fold. Um, so he was at a City of London fundraiser dinner no, that was, was organised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shock. And he was explaining to all of the, uh, the well, I wouldn't want to call them, oh, let's call them big cats. Because I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, to be, to be inclusive, well, rather than body shaming them. No, I meant, uh, no, but that's, there is also that. I was, I'm not sure how fat their pockets are. Okay, oh, right, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Indeterminate pockets. Yes. But I would say middling to deep. Yeah, yeah. so like, yeah, deeper than my pockets. Got you. Um, but not quite as deep as your pockets. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, anyway, so he's at this dinner and he's explained to them that Labour is the party of business, right? Sure is. Now, if you looked around the conference hall, I think it was about two million pounds Labour brought in mm. from selling out exhibition stands in the conference hall. And you've got everybody there. You know, you've got big tech, mm. you've got big firms, the unions, little slither, mm. tiny little slither of the of the place. BAE. I didn't see BAE, but then I should have but looked they for can that. See you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always watching. Sorry. Yeah. No. BAE. Yeah, but then they we wouldn't give them an exhibition stand. I was going to make such a good joke there. Sorry. Sorry. Go on. No, you go. No, but now I can't get the word right. So you were going to... I was going to do... So, yeah, we didn't give BAE an exhibition stand, but we did give them the contract to fly the security drones all around the conference hall and, and take everyone's ID. So that was that was good. my gag. So mine was going to be... <laughs> 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 yeah, you on. need to set it up again. So you need to say BAE were watching you. Oh, so yeah. So they were watching you. Yeah, they but, they, watching you. but they never hit on target, right? Oh. Do you get it? Yeah, but um bum So that's the... Very good. A lot of people asking us whether we're going to talk about Israel. We're, we are going to interview some experts about it. Uh, we're not going to talk about it ourselves. Well, we will talk about it ourselves, but we'll talk about it via the lens of experts because um, at the end of the day, I don't think... Pe I think people often feel like a sense of obligation to be like, God, there's this massive story in the news. There are people who know more about that than a lot of people. And I think the way for us to address that is to speak to some people with some expertise rather than for you and I to sit here having a pint and... No, for sure. Rabbit on about it. Well, this is what the, the what we were talking about over the weekend. I was like, I have, I'm not a scholar in this. Yeah. Um, I am not on the ground there. Mm -hmm. Um, I am on the ground at Labour. Back to back but, to business. Then. But when we're talking about politics, we do actually, you know, mostly know the people we're talking about. Yes, that's true. So you, you have some, you have quite a bit of skin in the game there. Well, yeah, and I don't know. They they just. You're absolutely right. You know, I've been. I've been doing this for the better part of 10 years now. And, you know, likewise, there's there's experience across the newsroom. But equally, I there's, I feel I, it's almost like a product of social media attention economy where it's like, you know, where were you? Where were you when the Westfold fell? Where were you? Why, what, you know, when, why, why did you say nothing? And it's like, well, I don't actually feel like I'm qualified to speak about most things. Mm -hmm. I can tweet about my courgettes and I'll take the piss out of Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. That's like my wheelhouse. That's yeah. where I feel safe. For me, it's the National Policy Forum. Is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we keep 
putting we we it feels like we're so, so close good. to starting to talk about talk about labor conference and then we just start fucking talking about something else. All right. Else. So back to what I was saying was yeah. this business side of it, right? So mm. you've got the exhibition hall yeah. and then you've got the uh, the other conference hall and there's a lot of companies putting on events, right? So I believe the conferences are like the main a big money spinner for all the big, political they're parties. A big money spinner. Yeah. But particularly this year, right. There were a lot of the presence was different. It was a hell of a lot of suits. Like nationwide were sponsoring a a, a, a lounge. Mm. A lot of other banks were doing it as well. Was there a Verve Clico tent? No, and uh, no. Sorry for next year. No, but there, there was a few Madries. You would have oh, loved God. it. The point being, I am going to cut you down to size <laughs> in a second. I swear to God. <laughs> um, the point being, it really felt like you know business leaders follow who they think is going to be in government, yeah. right? So they're not yeah. following. The people whose policies they like, mm. they're 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 there to put their two mm. cents into mm. the politicians who mm. are waiting to get into the Real to politics. the big seat, right? Yep. That's why it felt like it was government in waiting. A lot of those donors as well have switched from the Tories to Labour, right? Yeah. Katie Balls did a piece in the spec about this, like maybe about a month or so ago, maybe more now. And there's actually like significant financial backers who have left the Tory party to back Labour, and I think you could. I feel like the. The broke take is to be like, well, Keir Starmer is the same as the Tories, so they're happy to donate to him. The wo the woke take is, no, they're going to be in power and these people don't actually give a fuck about particularly yeah, the politics of it. They care about having influence. Yeah. Do, you, do you really think like Lord Sainsbury is saying, oh, actually, no. He was one of them. He was one of them. Yeah, he is. But actually, he is a good example who does care about the politics. Mm. So don't worry about that one. <laughs> Let me do that one again. <laughs> Do you really think Nat West? <laughs> but you know, when you know, is someone who's a lord, they're not thinking about I really care about like, you know, the cut of his jib. Mm. I care about what influence I can have when he's in power. I want my tax breaks. Yes, 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 yes. Before we get on to the cut of his jib, mm. a word on Sadiq Khan's social media feed this morning. Yeah. And the beavers mm. that have been released into West London. Four of them. Five of them? Five. Five of them. Five beavers on the loose. Yeah. I mean, round of applause. If we had a soundboard, you know, you go like... Shh. Should we get a soundboard? Yeah, we should. I think that would be an addition, wouldn't it? Um, Sadiq Khan tweeted this morning, for the first time in 400 years, a family of five beavers is being released into the wild in West London. Beavers are nature's architects and will help transform the area into a flourishing wetland. May their third eyelids be clear and their conception of time elongated. I added that last bit on. Yeah, I was like, where are you reading that from? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, my, that's my analysis. <laughs> Can you imagine the task that these little beavers have got ahead of them? What? <laughs> what is the task that no, well, those got... little beavers have Well, ahead look, of them? they're saying, you know, they're going to transform the area into a flourishing wetland. I they've mean, got a that's, lot of wood to get through. That's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You were talking the other week about how, you know, you've got a... They're moving planes. They're moving water planes. They're mm. moving roots, yeah, routes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, how's this going to tally with uh, the new LTNs? That's the. <laughs> <laughs> you train the beavers to bring down the ULES surveillance cameras. Oh. <laughs> That's what they arrested Lawrence Fox for. <laughs> <laughs> who? Yeah, d d sorry, I don't know who that fucking guy is. Um, no, what was I going to say? Look, we can retread this ground. <laughs> Are you about to say something profound about beavers? Yeah. Was that big sign? Yes. <laughs> Go on. I'm, I'm reaching the end of my fucking tether here. No, I'm, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as previously discussed, if we're going to be more flood resilient as a nation, we need more wetland. And the beavers create that. They're one of the only other animals in the animal kingdom that creates new habitat in the same way that humans do. I used to live on the wetlands in Tottenham and I don't remember seeing a lot of beavers. Because <laughs> there wouldn't be any. Yeah. Oh, it was a lot of herons though. Yep. Heron capital. Okay. I like a heron. I'm not sure what it's the capital of. It could be the capital of Tottenham. I'm sure there's a few herons floating around. Um, but that's the thing, right? There is more wetland for the herons to inhabit because the beavers create it. They create these slow moving ponds. By building their dams across the waterways, it creates, as discussed, the wetland habitat. Rather than, let's say, you've got this huge stream that's just like yeah. dead straight, which is easy to flood once it bursts its banks. You create this sort of more meandering waterscape that, one, fish love. The fish love the slow-moving ponds, particularly trout, actually. 
And then what do heron eat? Fish. Happy days for the heron. You've given them a, a, a bountiful, a bountiful new hunting ground. And this is this this explains the sort of um the uh What's it called? It's it's like a fucking hell. I've forgotten the 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 phrase for it. It's, it's like a cascade. It's something cascade. The way in which one slight change to the ecosystem, uh, hypertrophic cascade, um, one slight change to the makeup of an ecosystem can completely change its makeup. So, for example, if you introduce when they reintroduce wolves to Yellowstone, you are so rude. <laughs> And laughing. <laughs> Sorry, am I boring you? No. You, I I'm, am. I promise you, I'm actually enthralled. <laughs> so one way. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Please tell me. No, no. Please tell me about the wolves in Yellowstone. When they reintroduced the wolves in Yellowstone, they didn't reintroduce particularly many of them, but actually the impact that the those the small number of wolves had on the overall deer population in Yellowstone was massive, massive. Not least because the deer were far more uh, alert and it and it and and their number got reduced because they were being predated by the wolves. But it actually changed their behaviour far more significantly in that the presence of the wolves meant that the deer no longer entered areas where it was easier to hunt them. So, for example, they wouldn't go down into valleys or into areas with 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 um, with a sheer cliff face next to them because obviously it's harder for them to escape if, if wolves pen them in there. Right. They just completely left those areas, and as a result of that, the vegetation in those areas was able to grow and replenish in a far more bountiful way so the height of the, the average height of the trees in those areas doubled doubled and doubled again really yes the root systems from those trees then secured the banks of the rivers to reduce erosion and therefore change the path of the rivers in yellowstone so and then again because because of that you then get more beavers you get more fish and just by introducing one predator and a very low number you can completely change the ecosystem in an area. I completely believe that, that you don't need many wolves, because hypothetically, <laughs> right now, if someone were to say there's a wolf in this studio, that would be enough to get us to leave. There is, baby. <laughs> oh, woo! <laughs> Sorry, please go on with your very serious point. But on the premise of it doesn't matter if there are five wolves in here or a singular wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would leave, right? <laughs> Yes, you're the deer in the analogy, yeah. What are you? The wolf. <laughs> <laughs> the slug. Yeah, the slug daddy, yeah. The shepherd. Of the, the flock. Of the slug the shepherd. <laughs> um, could you beat a wolf in a fight? Could I? Yeah. I couldn't beat a slug. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> No chance. Yeah? Life or death? No chance. You're just going quietly into that good night. I think this is going to be like one of those football things where I'm just like, couldn't do it. <laughs> okay, fine. Couldn't do it. You're not in the two percent of people that just believe they could beat any animal. Do you think in you could beat a wolf? I tell you what. Do you reckon you could train a wolf? One hundred percent. That's something I dream about a lot. Have you ever considered training a crow? Because that's like a small scale start. You yeah. know, you don't. I have a good friend who did this. We've talked about it before, I think. Oh, sorry. No, 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 not on the podcast, as in you and I, that we would like to have a murder of crows at the disposal of politics, Joe. Yeah. Because so, you can feed them and then they'll come and eat the food and they'll associate you with food, right? And then if other people start to fuck with you, they fuck with that person. Because yeah. they're like, that is our food. You don't, you don't touch that. You don't come in our house. We but protect it, this house. It's quite a responsibility because it follows you. So what he found was that he would be walking to Clapton Station and he'd be walking and Crow would be following him. Well, aerially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> slowly above him. And he'd be like, shit. I mean, it has, it has like real Norse god energy about it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's like, I am Odin. Sometimes I, I think he wanted to go out without the Crow. I wouldn't. Because he couldn't go to the billet after that. No, you could, come on. You're like... Where we go one, we go all, to quote QAnon, you know? Sure. I bring my boys with me. And this motherfucker right here up in the sky, he's one of my boys. But you're married and this guy was... <laughs> but this, <laughs> but this guy was trying to date women. I'm sorry, I would in a heartbeat. You have a crow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you mean to tell me he's one of your boys? <laughs> I'm in. 
where are we going? <laughs> Your place or mine? <laughs> as long as the crow's as there. As long as the crow's there, watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Let's talk about Labour conference. Yes. Um, my big takeaway from Keir Starmer's speech at Labour conference was that either Keir Starmer himself or someone else is a big fan of politics, Joe. What made you say that? The content of his speech. Right. But we'll get to that because I felt like you were going to say something else. No, because I agree with that on the green grey belt thing. Yeah. We're, we're always on about that. We are. That's example number one. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Mariana fucking Matsukato. Oh, yeah. Here she goes. Mission government. And I, you could almost quote, I think it might be down here. Do we put it down here? Is it on the list? Maybe not. He talked about, no, he talked about um, how the private sector often mitigates the risk of investment and research by partnering with the public sector, but then all of the risk is socialized and all of the reward is privatized. The private companies get the reward. Uh, the, the state does not. Mission government, mm -hmm. he said in one of his closing lines. Matsukato comes in here all the time. She does, and she's a big fan of you. Excuse me? Yeah. How do you know that? Well, she just, you know. Oh, you, you, sorry, she lets me interview her, right? Yeah. yeah, fine. I'm sorry, my heart started fluttering. Yeah, I was like, wait, wait, what do you want me to say? <laughs> no, I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe you guys have been talking about me. I don't know. I want to see what, <laughs> what, what Mariana had to say about me. I don't know. <laughs> Um, she, <laughs> no, she's got a big old brain on her and she talks, she talks about her ideas, sat right where you are. So that was, that was number two. Mm -hmm. Number three, it wasn't explicitly Paul Joe, but it was when I was on, the, I was on Laura Kunzberg, Kunzberg and they interviewed Keir and Laura said to me, what do you want to hear from Keir Starmer? And I said, I want to hear him say he's going to build a million homes every year for, of the, his first parliament, every year for the next five years, I want him to build a million homes. Boom. And look, it's basically become policy. We'll get into the fact that it's not really policy. But nonetheless, I think he's a big I think he's a big guy. She actually put it to him, right, in the interview. She said, are you going to do what Ollie Dugmore said? You're going to build a million homes for you. Did she say, say Ollie Dugmore? She did, yeah. Did she? She did. She didn't say anything about Matsukati? No. Ask the misogyny. <laughs> this was months ago. This, was, this isn't in the, uh, the most recent interview she did with him. This was, and Because that was Derbyshire, wasn't it, I think, who did yeah. Starmer on the show. Anyway, nonetheless, my thesis... Keir Starmer, big Paul Joe guy. Yeah. You don't believe that. No, I'm just wondering whether to say something else to add on to that. I think you should. Okay, well, it just makes sense because perhaps a couple of people from the team have been asking why haven't we reacted to the speech yet? Now it's all falling into place. <laughs> it is falling into Getting place. Getting it, guys. It's happening. You're listening. I believe also one You're of You're listening to the Labour Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> More lines as they WhatsApp them to me right now. Um, uh, I believe one of them also complained to you... Um, no? I think we might be going too far. Anyway. Fine, sure, sure. Nonetheless... That would be on the Patreon. Yeah, oh, yeah that's up. Patreon only. That's Patreon yeah. only. That's the, the, the what, what, what one, one staffer texts to Ava about this podcast. Um, <laughs> and, and me specifically. Uh, right, it hasn't okay. upset him at all. No, it's got... Oh, anyway, yeah. drink your madri. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, back to business. Sorry. Oh, there <laughs> drink your beer and make your stupid little jokes. Um... Right. I want to get that line about trickle down politics, trickle down economics, because I thought that was fun. From Starmer. Yeah. Okay. So whilst you're doing that, I'll go. I'll go a little bit deeper then into the housing pledge because <laughs> my initial reaction was one of of happiness. Mm -hmm. Here, Starmer says he's going to build 1.5 million homes. Well, whoop de fucking do. Someone had to do it. He slayed the green belt sacred cow. He's going to build on the grey belt, as they've been calling it. The the parts of the green belt that, that need development, and that's good. Those green belt areas around London, but also the other cities and, and towns in London's orbit, that is prime land for development. If you are going to build houses anywhere, you build them around your most expensive, least affordable cities, your hearts of economic development. That is where you want your growth. You know who came up with this idea? That happened. Or who wrote about this idea, at least? Tell me. John Elledge, who was on the podcast the other week. Great episode. He wrote a while ago that Starmer should build where they're not going to vote for him. Mm. I actually saw him tweeting being like, they've literally done my fucking policy. Oh. No, he's... What? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, then I drilled down into it more. And the devil is in the detail. 
ladies and gentlemen, because yes, Keir Starmer has pledged to build 1.5 million homes. Five years in a parliament. Do the maths. 300,000 homes a year. You might think, well, that's great. That's excellent. Let me tell you, Ava Santina, we already build 220 to 240,000 homes a year. Mm -hmm. So we are talking a 25% increase of what we've got already. Well, yeah, but you could argue some estimates say the Tories were near to completing 300,000 by the end of last year. And therefore, saying we will build 300,000 homes a year, mm. saying we'll build 1.5 million homes, sounds pretty radical. It's actually just a continuation of current house building targets. However, yeah. he's making the right, he's right, he's making the right mo mood music. He's saying we are going to build new houses. So, you know, I don't want to get, can we get too down on him? Don't we get too down on him? I back him for that. The Centre for Cities, when you compare European data to UK data, says that in recent history, there has been a shortfall in British housing of 4.4 million homes built. We are 4.4 million homes behind France and other European competitors. We should be building 1 million homes a year. Why not be that ambitious? Like, I like the stuff that he said about, for example, compulsory purchase orders. I like the stuff he said about changing the planning system because really all of this, yeah, let's build a million homes. Unless you change, the, unless there's planning reform, it's, ne it's never achievable, right? We have at the moment a highly discretionary planning system, which I've mentioned before to other people who've listened to the podcast, but just for a moment. Basically, Britain's planning system at the moment means that development is done pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis. So every single housing development that you want to happen can be stopped, can be blocked by NIMBYs, by town, town planning meetings, all of that sort of stuff. Instead, if you move to, and that's highly unusual on an international level, like we're one of the only countries that, that plans, plans in that way. If instead you move to a rules-based planning system where you zone areas for development in a local town plan, for example, and you say, if your development hits these criteria. So let's say these are the, this is the build quality specification. This is the amount of infrastructure that needs to come as part of it. This is what you need to do in terms of public con contributing to the public, tra public transport infrastructure in the area. Your development happens. It's not opposed. The, the local consultation happens at the town plan level. So that instead of people being able to block every single individual bit of development, because if you say to people broadly, do we need more houses in the area? They'll say yes. They'll just say, not next to me. Mm. Coincidentally, then when every single development tries to happen, the people that live in the area of it try to block it. So what you do is you have your public consultation at the plan stage where you say, these are the areas we're zoning for development. This is where residential will be. This is where X will be. This will be Y will be. And if that gets passed, they can no longer oppose it. The houses get built. That's something that needs to happen. And he did suggest there would be planning reform in his speech as well. But then is it going to be like the Tory planning reform that was just blocked? Yeah. Because the, the Tory planning reform was... Was that generic, wasn't it? It was a little bit of gove, wasn't it? Most recently, yeah. Um, Gove wanted to build how many hundred? Like, wasn't it a hundred thousand? He was ready to go. Um, yeah. And then, but he wanted no. He wanted to relax the planning regulations so that he, you could dump a load of waste into the rivers, right? It's just classic, classic. classic and then the Lib Tory Dems politics. have come out with the most. They were quite ambitious, weren't they? Their housing pledge. Sorry, strap yourselves in. <clears throat> there. <laughs> Their housing pledge is allow to allow everyone in the local area to consult on any new construction. Okay, so that's zero new houses built, right? <laughs> yeah. Very, very good, lads. That's like uh, that's the NIMBY manifesto. Just, just so, just for comparison, right? Just, I've got some numbers here for you, Ava. So listen to me. Listen to me now. Two hundred twenty, two hundred forty thousand new homes a year, roughly on average, here in Britain. Keir Starmer has done the extraordinary thing and pledged that we'll get that to three hundred thousand. You might say, "Wow, twenty-five percent." That's a, that's a significant increase, especially for something as substantial as housing. France builds roughly 380,000 homes a year. We're down from a recent peak of half a million before the financial crash. Crash. Japan currently building 860,000 homes a year, even though their population is shrinking. Our population is growing. These things are possible. They are possible. Aren't we building less houses than we built just before the war ended or something like that? Or is it the same number that is after the war? There was something about the war. I <laughs> there usually is in British politics. Well, I can't understand it throughout the lens of the war. Without the lens of the Second World War, I um, it wouldn't surprise me. But there was a very there was a pretty radical. I think that what they were, I think they're planning for similar. Right? They're 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 suggesting that it will be like a, a a similar you know Second World War new towns, uh, national renewal mm. when there was a lot of building. And I wouldn't know actually particularly about the data during the Second World War, but one would assume that probably with a lot of houses being bombed that there was probably quite a lot of building going on yeah, um, or repair work. 
the taking pro- place. The problem is what you need to do is just build it. You just need to build social housing. 100%. You just need to say... Council housing specifically, yeah. But, you know, okay, so earlier I was on Jeremy Vine. Mm. C- contentious topic around here. Yeah, just a bit of celebrity in the booth on Jeremy Vine. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, so they're talking, they were talking about how Norfolk is not going to, they don't want any second homes there anymore, right? They don't want people like getting second homes and renting them out on Airbnb. Mm. And there was this guest on there who was a councillor in the local area. Mm. And the guy was just literally like some jumped up, counselor older guy who was like well i actually have a second home and i really like it and uh you know they're really good for local business and i would like to encourage people to buy more of them and it was like well have you thought about you know in perhaps some new builds have you thought about you know encouraging house building in your area and it's like we are we are we've just built two new uh two new houses they're half a million pounds each what young person could afford that and i was like yeah Yes, <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say to you. <laughs> and like, it's in your jurisdiction to mm-hmm. have a look at it. Absolutely. No, it's totally agree. And he was like, we've got these beautiful rolling golf courses. It's like, golf courses? Babe, the birth rate's low. Like, we've got, <laughs> we need some houses. Uh, Elledge, you mentioned, you, me- you mentioned a friend of the podcast, John Elledge. He wrote a really good piece about housing that used golf as a metaphor. That was like, if there was another minority interest that required huge amounts of space, for example... The amount of golf courses in London, total um, square meterage, it accounts to an area about the same size as the London Borough of Brent. No way. Yeah. And in what rational society? So let, let's say, I don't know, let's say there was a sport where people uh, people were really into like screaming at the top of their voices. They competitively screamed. And because they competitively screamed, they needed huge amounts of space so as to not disturb anyone around them. And even though like less than 1% of the population did it, and yeah, maybe by the way, about 95% of the people that were interested in it were men. <laughs> you would say cool guys but unfortunately the need of the city of london to build housing means that your fairly niche interest in screaming in large open spaces is going to be overridden <laughs> because it takes up an area the size of brent that's excellent and actually we have a housing crisis and yet and there are obviously arguments about about golf but at the end of the day it is still a minority interest the amount of land that's given over to it how expensive that land is in an, in an area where we desperately need it to build houses. And it does crap for the water table. Mm. But this is just a big old John Elledge love him. Maybe we get him in as a guest. But it's good for the it's good for the lad's mental health. Always, yeah. Going for a walk. Did you watch Ask that him video? Ask if he's okay on did the you, golf cart. Did you watch the Norwich? <laughs> I did. The Norwich City video. I did, yeah. God, what a video. Yeah, it was good, that. That really took it out of me. Yeah, very, um, you know, that's, that's the proper way to, to talk about mental, mental health in a, in a non-madry way. Isn't it that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mate. <laughs> um, what else was there in the speech? Yeah, I, I'm just cautious, right? I know I was being a bit glib earlier when I said, oh, yeah, Starmer, clearly big Paul Joe guy. Uh, with the Matsu Kato, with the Matsu Kato stuff. She says at the end of the most recent interview um, that I did with her, you don't just... you." you don't do don't the phrase she used was like it, mission government is like smart economics it's not dumb economics dumb economics is saying yeah there's a climate crisis but we're going to water down the 28 billion a year that we're going to put into it dumb economics is saying not every child needs free school meals because actually both of those things are it's it's almost a, no, a no-brainer right in terms of the cost input for what you get out of it mm. as a result um so at a very dramatic end of the scale it's yeah, okay, 28 billion a year. That's a fuckload of money. That is a lot, lot, lot of money to be investing into the green transition, which will not just involve the building of offshore and onshore wind, will also involve pylons crisscrossing this country. It will mean connections to the national grid all over the place. And it will mean deregulating the way in which that we connect. Like it's, it's transformative. Miliband's in trouble over that, though. I bet he is. I bet he is. They're like, where are you going to put the pylons? Well, everywhere on the golf course yeah i don't think so <laughs> no i need to do my screaming here <laughs> i can't hear it over the buzz of the pylons um you don't you don't water down that pledge because yes it's a lot of money but a lot of money pales into insignificance when part of an equation where the other side of it is the ecological collapse of the planet uh you know the very limited I, I, I can't remember the most recent estimate what it was for free school meals. I feel like it may even have been a billion quid. Or maybe that was in London, I can't remember. But No, it, it's really not expensive. You're on the right track. Carry on. 
Not expensive to you with your middling to deep pockets, one billion pounds. Well, you know, I've been hanging out with Mandelson. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, okay, the um, educational and entertainment benefits of a child not being hungry at school and therefore able to concentrate are significant. So we make the investment. Um, building a house. Have it, the, 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 capital, the capital expenditure in order to build the housing, yeah, okay, you could say it's going to be billions of pounds. It's compulsory purchase orders and we're going to have to change the entire planning system. But the net benefit of having good quality, affordable housing sees improvement in education outcomes. It sees reduced crime outcomes. It sees better health outcomes. The net good for the economy, because what is an economy? It's people. It's, it's, almost, it's almost immeasurable, right? You see, you see the benefits of doing it. And, in, and instead of going, well, actually, we're going to maintain the, the Tory party's fiscal rules for the first two years of a Labour government. Instead of saying we're going to water down the £28 billion a year, you say... No, there is actually an economic orthodoxy in either tax and spend, which he's ruled out, in borrowing. He's also ruled that out. So what are you left with? Cutting. Mm. Where else do you get the money from to, 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 make those things, to make those things? And actually, you know, I think economically, um, and I, but it's not just me saying this, by the way. This is, uh, this, I'm lifting most of this from an Andy Haldane interview that you gave to the New Statesman about a year ago, former senior guy at the Bank of England. Like, he is the orthodoxy. Saying that there's a, there's about a Rizla between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer economically, and that actually having some slightly out there thinking and being a bit more progressive and out of the box, blue sky thinking or whatever corporate way he expressed it, there's a lot that can be done. Well, what do you think that is then? Is it short termism? I think it's terror. Right. I think it's fear. I think they're absolutely terrified of. Uh, losing the prospect of the first Labour government in 13 years. I mean, rightly so. You know, you're 20 points ahead. It must be terrifying to be 20 points ahead because that's a that's a farcical number, isn't it? Mm. To be in opposition. Yeah. It'll narrow once you get to election day. I've got no yeah, doubt about yeah. that. But still, so you go, don't fuck this up. I think they'll be relieved by it. You look at you look at you look at 2019. You look at the result in 2019. Uh, and this might be learning the wrong lesson of it. I would say it's part of the lesson. But, you know, um, you say people don't want economic radicalism. So we go for technocracy, we go for managerialism. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Look, there are, there are part, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm in two minds about, about Keir Starmer's Labour Party. I really am. Because on the one hand, you're going, we're going to build our own, um, you know, nationalised energy company. And you go, oh, that sounds pretty, sounds pretty funky. Mm. Sounds like that's something I could jive to. You say we're going to build one and a half million new homes. You go, oh, okay. You're getting there. And you drill down into it and you think about it a bit more and it kind of, I don't know. I don't know. You do know. But maybe we're being a bit, uh, oh gosh, maybe we're being a bit much on him. You think? Well, possibly. I mean, the election isn't called, is it? No. Do you know what and I And he's still flirting with the electorate now, isn't he, really? He's flirting with the business leaders, flirting with the prospect of becoming prime minister. Mm. It would be a little bit weird if he... Ha okay. At what point in time has nailing down your pledges worked? Like, did it work for Ed Miliband carving it into the stone, for example? No. Yet stone. No. And I think it's a bit of a trap as well, right? That you, you fall into. Uh, and it's a, a tale as old as time where the right wing press and the Tories say, Oh, you don't even have a plan. And then you come out with a plan. And they're like, It's uncosted. And people think you're not credible. So you wait for it. You, you wait to publish your manifesto. So there's a bit of that going on. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how pro progressive a Keir Starmer government is because at the same time, you know, you, you hear the stuff about um, police crime sensing and courts and public order, you know, that none of that legislation is going to get rolled back. We've got to wait for it to bed in and see how it's, see how it's enforced. And it's some of the most draconian authoritarian legislation that we've seen. And so you say, you say, right, well, that's, he's a narc. You know, he is a former narc. So he must love that kind of stuff. No, but I'm trying to understand it from the perspective of someone who is actually running for government, right? Yeah. And would it be a good use of time, for example, while, while protest is key to a democracy, right? And mm. I'm not denying that at all. It's important. Mm. 
Would it be the best thing right now when you are in the middle of a cost of living crisis, when you're about to put down this new deal for workers, mm. when you're, you know, you're about to embark on all these infrastructure projects to so say in the first 100 days, I'm going to re repeal the police and police crime and sentencing bill. Yeah. Is it, is it the right time to do it? I'm just, I'm just, I'm not being a cuck. I'm just saying from the lens of someone, if I, if you were actually going to be prime minister, would that be a, a really good use of your first hundred days? Because it's not like you can just go, right, repeal, lick the stamp, here we go. You know, it's got to go back to the commons. Mm. You've got to chat about it. There's got to be debates, uh, motions. It's got to go to the Lords. Just railroaded. Our speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, has got to turn up to work. <laughs> it's, there's a lot going on. Yeah, there is. No, King's speech, King speech it, railroad it through. Just fucking be done with it. Egregious invasion of civil liberties. Job done. Yeah. you got, hopefully, hopefully, that's cuck behaviour, saying that, saying hopefully. A massive majority and um you'll be able to get through whatever legislative agenda you want you know put, do what the americans do executive orders fucking build a guillotine get rid of charles presidential system executive orders new government first day sign them away trump style there's like half of your legislative agenda gone be rid of you it's like ollie dugmore the covid skeptics <laughs> have finally all come together <laughs> we're one and the same that's what they did. They brought in legislative power to uh KRS. How much time have we got? Perfect. Okay. Last little bit then on Scotland, because if they are going to have a slamming majority, which I think they are, Scotland has to be a part of it, right? You have the Rutherglen by election. You have I think Anna Sawa and the guy who won that by election, whose name is Shanks. Mm. Michael Shanks? Matthew Shanks? Well, I didn't even know we were doing Scotland right now. I thought we were talking about the speech. We can, Yeah, no, because in the speech, Anasawa and Michael Shanks were the only two politicians he mentioned by name. Well, that's because they really want to pick up in Scotland, isn't it? Exactly. Do you know what's that so... That's the point I was just making. Okay, but, sorry. I'm really tired, okay? Can I just have some context? I, re I really got in late. I had to drive a lot yesterday. I'm tired. Um, what's... What, yeah. Anyway, what's interesting, though... This time, even six months ago, actually, probably a year ago, we would have thought it unfathomable. It would have been unfathomable for Labour to have win, won in Scotland, primarily because the party was bankrupt and it mm. couldn't afford to do campaigning there. It couldn't do a risky campaign. You know, they, they only had to go for the, the by-elections that they were absolutely going to win. Like There was all that chat a while back. Do you know when oh, they gave Tiverton and Honiton to the Lib Dems in that by-election. They just let them have it. And it was like, they couldn't afford to do the campaign there. Mm. That was actually yeah. why they let them have it. Mm -hmm. Now, they've got more donations coming in than the Conservative Party. And uh, Nicola Sturgeon's gone. I feel, I feel sorry for Hamza Yusuf because he must have a fucking target on his back from Police Scotland. They've had, yeah. a, they've had, a, they've had a, a track record, haven't they? Every single leader has been nicked. It's good. It's good. <laughs> They'll come for him eventually. I, I, it's funny, isn't it? The way we talk about like the impropriety of the Conservative Party when basically they were given the equivalent of speeding tickets over the party gate stuff. When the SNP leadership have literally all been arrested at one point after being leader. Um, I think they're largely discredited. I think they are... I think... That Labour, there's no route to Westminster power for Labour without Scotland. It's basically unachievable. Mm. And if the SNP implodes all of a sudden you're back on track to semi-regular Labour majorities, in my view. I don't know. I still think, I, I do think that there, there's a fervour. that I, I, I mean, I don't think Starmer's actually done enough for Scotland to want to be mm. really in bed with him. Mm. We should get Hamza in. Yeah, why not? Should do that. He's probably pretty desperate right now. <laughs> we'll get Hamza in. I wonder how he'll handle the intro. We'll get him in. Maybe we go up to him. Maybe we take this puppy on the road. I'd quite like to go to Aberdeen. I know you don't like it there. Every time we have this conversation, <laughs> it gets cut out of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he's like, yeah, have great British energy. We'll build that in Scotland. I don't Starmer. think this Scotland conversation has been good at all. This one? This Scotland bit. Okay. Well, maybe that's the end of it. <laughs> Should we try it again? 
Um, I think we'll 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 just have, we'll do some light chats. We'll do some light chats. You also at Labour Conference um, live podcast, live podcast with Mick Lynch. Are we done talking about politics already? We've been talking about politics for at least five minutes. We did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I'd say half. Well, I'd say half. I and would half. actually just like to briefly talk about. Um... No, actually, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. So. Okay. Don't worry about Very it. Very good news. Tell me more about Mick Lynch. Tell me about the live podcast. How was it? Yeah, he was good actually. Yeah. It was good fun. What was the vibe like in the main room? The vibe was giving me. I think we should do more of these. Well, Ava Santina. Mm. Maybe we will. Maybe. Where can people, it, we should make a place where people can register their interests. I think it'd be in the subreddit, wouldn't it? The subreddit yeah. is the place for, I used to say it's the place for good faith discussion and memes. It's now just memes. Mm-hmm. Um, I lifted one from it earlier, actually, to tweet. Was it Doug Moore's farm? It wasn't Doug Moore's farm. It was um, the time of the beaver has come. Yeah, that's great. I used that to quote tweet Sadiq. That's good, though. When he, with his beaver announcement. It was good. There's some excellent stuff in there. I mean, can I tell you as well, the amount of um, tuna-based Instagram content I get that because I'm a sensitive and caring friend, I neither post on Instagram or send, <laughs> send directly to Ed or, <laughs> or post in the subreddit. And I think I should get some fucking flowers or something. What, is that. it like an algorithm thing? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You've been looking up tuna on Instagram? A little bit, I think. Yeah. That's real oh, married man territory there, isn't it? Where's my phone? Fuck, it's on charge. Um, I saw a real good sam- salmon the other day with the, um, you know, that we were talking about the jaw, the changes the salmon undergo yeah. when they swim out river. Crystal clear um, example of a, of a deformed male. Yeah. But I didn't send that to him either because I'm a good guy. I think we should do a bit on the podcast about proportional representation. Yeah, probably. Not today. Sounds fun. I think we should serious. wait until Ed comes back for that. Yeah, let's subject him to that. Well, because there was a protest about it at Labour Conference mm. on the bridge, and then there was the ultimate protest, which was the guy who jumped on stage with Starmer. He was yeah, fighting. should we talk, we talk about that for 30 seconds? No, I don't need to talk anymore. No, no, I'm, I'll happily talk about it, because, it, I mean, this is, the, this is the, the fucking part of the joke of it, right, is that I still feel like we've... We spent the first half an hour of this talking about fucking beavers and and yeah. and rum, rum parties, and the I was I was looking at people's write ups of the speech and literally the first thing in all of them is like there was a protester, um, he threw glitter on Keir. Ah, um, no, but it wasn't that. It was more like it's a pretty it's a pretty serious fucking problem. How did he get up there? Yeah, it's bad. It's really bad. Like it's crazy. I mean, part part of it, it for me is if you want to be a figure in public life. You're going to get people throwing milkshakes at you every now and then. That like comes with the territory. Yeah, but throwing a milkshake is so different from like. I'd say throwing a milkshake is worse than being glittered. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the glitter. I'm talking about if you are walking through the street where you are encountering the yeah, public yeah, 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 yeah. and someone throws a milkshake on you, okay. Yeah. That is, you know, shit happens. Mm-hmm. If you are on stage and you have got apparently the best security possible yeah, all serious, around you and someone managed problem. to break that wall. Yeah, it's a serious security. That's problem. Not Nuts. See, Angela Rayner said that she thought she was going to have to go full John Prescott and punch him. Mm, nice. I enjoyed seeing one of the cameras pan to like Reeves and Lammy and they were going like, for God's sake. Yeah. Oh, God, can you just let him have his moment? No, oh. I, I thought Lammy was upset because I thought Lammy was directing the security. I think he was like, oh, was he? he was like, for God's sake, <laughs> are you watching this? <laughs> Protect our boy. Yeah. Um, he was yeah. like pointing the other way. <laughs> God, let him in. Yeah. No, I uh I think it comes to the territory, you know. Mick said in the in the in the podcast with you, didn't he? There was a time when politicians used to um actually like give public give big stump speeches. They'd go to debating halls, they'd go and they'd speak and face the music. Deal with hecklers, deal with challenge to their argument. And now um whatever the fucking line was he said. What did he say? He was like, if he thinks if he thinks that bothers me, he doesn't know me. <laughs> you know who deals well with that and who does go to debating chambers and that? Nigel Farage. Well, he's a man of the people. Eh? He, That's why. No, but that is actually a, one, a real skill he has. He will go and debate anyone. He doesn't yeah. care. And you know who else actually had a bit of flavor of that? I'm sorry. Boris Johnson. 
outside Conservative Party one time, two police officers. He was he was someone was going to leap on him. This is when he wasn't prime minister was mm. before. Someone was going to leap on him. Two police officers tried to escort him, and he was like to the police officers, "Get off me!" Mm. Like he was like, "No, yeah. give it to me." Yeah, there was a time, but now it's it's stage managed. You, you can thank you can thank New Labour for that as well, but it's. The, it's the executive politician, isn't it? Manicured. Ed's um, dad. He won't be happy about that. Did we? Did we clarify that ever? Did we? Say, did we? We make it clear that, that was a joke. What was a joke? That Alice Campbell isn't Ed's dad. What? <laughs> Very good. Any more for any more? No. Join the subreddit. Um, maybe we'll do another live podcast. Let us know if you do want us to. Goodbye for now.